welcome back to The Wandering Wesleyan. This is Chaplain Greg, and uh, it's so good to have you with me today. Uh, we're continuing our walking in the Word, and we're in the New Testament. Uh, we've uh, gone through the first two Gospels, Matthew and Mark, and now we're into Dr. Luke's, uh, doc Dr. Luke's writings. And uh, we went through his Gospel last week, and this week we're going to go through, well, what Paul Harvey would call the rest of the story, what happened after the crucifixion resurrection, uh, picking up right at the assumption of Jesus into heaven. So the Acts of the Apostles were probably written about the same time as the Gospel. Um, it, the focus is divided into two parts. So there's really two very distinct parts here. The focus is divided between chapters 1 through 12, and that's Jerusalem and it was ministering to the Jews. And then chapters 13 through 28, the focus shifts drastically, and it centers on spreading the gospel to the Gentiles. Remember, the gospel was first for the Jews and then to the Gentiles, because remember, let's go back to Genesis. The promise to Abraham, the promise even to Eve, is that the whole world would be saved. And in Abraham, it was going to be his family, somewhere in his family, that salvation would come for the whole world, not just for his family, but for everybody. So, like the gospel, the focus is on the kingdom of God. But it's different because Jesus taught us about the kingdom of God, then he demonstrated to us what we should be doing as citizens of the kingdom of God. All right? In the, in the book of Acts, it's his followers, post-resurrection, what they did to bring the kingdom of God into the whole world. Okay? So unlike the gospel, which it's mentioned over 30 times, this kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, it's only mentioned six times. Why is that? Because the kingdom of God is now the reality with the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that brings us to the second chapter of Acts. The second chapter of Acts is really important because it is the birth of the church. So think about this scene. There's about 100 folks gathered in the upper room. Jesus has ascended into heaven. He hasn't set the Holy Spirit yet. They've decided on who's going to replace Judas. A guy named Matthias replaces Ju Judas. Think about who would be up there. Think about all the folks that would be up there. Well, obviously, the 11 disciples plus Matthias. Mary Magdalene was probably up there. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They were probably there. Um... The woman who was healed of bleeding. Was she up there? The one, the one of the ten lepers. Remember in one of the stories, Jesus heals ten lepers and only one came back to thank him. Maybe he was up there. The formerly blind Bartimaeus. Maybe he was up there. It's, it's so interesting to think of who might have been in the upper room. All of these stories of people who encounter who have encounters with Jesus many of them were probably in that upper room so in acts chapter 2 the holy spirit came upon them and notice the imagery from the temple okay rushing wind which is like the cloud hovering over the tabernacle by day also like the glory clouds the tabernacle and the dedication you know all of that when when the temple dedication when you read those stories of the of what happened during the tabernacle and the temple during the dedication of those two of those two places there's a lot of imagery that is put on the individuals that are in the upper room that are that's similar to those entering of God into the temple and the tabernacle. Uh, separate flames of fire rested on each one of them. So this is like the pillar of fire over the tabernacle or the near tamid 
the everlasting light that's in the temple. All of these point to the presence of God dwelling in believers, which gets us back to the garden, the pre-snake garden, where our first parents had unlimited, unfettered access to the presence of God. And we as followers of Jesus, because Jesus paid the penalty for our, for our sin, be it from his death and resurrection, defeated death, ascended into heaven, sent his Holy Spirit, and now the very presence of God resides in us. The proclamation of the gospel in Acts chapter 2 were the, to the people in Jerusalem. So what is the gospel? Well, let's take Peter's sermon. First of all, the gospel is Jesus is the Messiah. That's really important. He is the Savior. He is the one that was foretold that would be coming. Jesus is God. That's an important one. He is part of the triune God sent here. Jesus was crucified. Jesus was raised from the dead. His Holy Spirit can now rest and with every follower of his. And all that's required is repentance of sin, turning away from sin. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is Jesus. The gospel is Jesus who has become king and now resides in every single person who repents of sin and follows him. 3,000 people in Acts chapter 2 come to faith. Now, I'm going to show you a picture here of the southern steppes in Jerusalem when I was there. And this area is full of, remember those cleansing bathtubs that I talked about, the mikvahs? There's a bunch of them there. Enough that probably 3,000 people in an afternoon or so could get baptized, and 3,000 people were. This is the beginning of something the New Testament calls ecclesia, or the church, the gathering. Ecclesia means gathering. It's a Greek word meaning gathering. It's the word that's used for church all throughout the New Testament. The church is not a building, and this is something that... Um, that that Luke and the rest of the rest of the New Testament writers stress over and over again. The church is not a building, but a gathering of people who are followers of Jesus the Messiah. The connection between the followers is what? The Holy Spirit. The connected believers are the kingdom of God. Every person who encounters a follower of Jesus should receive a taste of what that kingdom of God is like. So you, if you've put your faith, hope, and trust into Jesus, are a citizen and a carrier of the kingdom of God and the presence of God. And the question I pose to you is, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that you carry with you the presence of God to each and every person you meet? The kingdom of God is an invasion force into this world. So one of the analogies that I often use um, is the analogy of D-Day. So on June 6th, 1944, the Allies invaded Europe um, at Normandy in France, and Hitler's defeat was assured, completely assured. It hadn't happened. There was a lot of fighting left to be done. But as soon as that foothold was gained, Hitler's defeat was assured. When Jesus was resurrected, ascended to heaven, and sent his, his Holy Spirit, Satan's defeat was assured. There's still a lot of fighting to be done. There's still a lot of spiritual warfare to be done. But each and every citizen of the kingdom of God is equipped, and we'll get to this in Paul's writings, is equipped to fight this battle. Let's move on then from, we, we spent a lot of time on just ch chapter two, but let's, let's move on there because we get into more stories in the book of Acts. 
uh, the stories of Stephen and Philip. Now, like Mark, Luke is a name dropper. So you will see him mention people's names early in his accounts and then bring them to a more fuller role later on. So Stephen and Philip are introduced first as deacons. And they're just mentioned in passing, but both of them have a very significant part to play. Stephen eventually was executed by this guy named Saul. Saul, who was to later be called Paul. Um, Philip had several different um, encounters, first with an Ethiopian eunuch who was himself a Gentile. Um, He brought him to faith as well as ministered to the Samaritans. So here you see the gospel going out from Jerusalem to different places. Acts, the book of Acts is one speech after another. They're they're very powerful and very potent speeches. So I'm going to give you a list of them here. There's a bunch. So Acts chapter 2 verses 4 through 36 is Peter. Chapter 4, 5 through 12 is Peter again. Acts chapter 7 is Stephen. Acts chapter 10, 34 through 43 is Peter. 11, 1 through 18, again, is Peter. Now Paul comes in, and it's chapter 12, verses 16 through 41, Paul. Uh, 14, 15 through 17 is Paul. Acts chapter 15, um, verses 13 through 21, James, the brother of Jesus, has a speech. Uh, Chapter 17, 22 through 31, and uh, 20 through 18 through 35, 22, 1 through 21, 24, 10 through 21, 26, 2 through 23. All these are speeches of Paul. These speeches are testimonies. They're sermons. They are presentations of the gospel. There's so much that you can learn by reading and digesting all of these different speeches and sermons. When we get to Acts chapter 9, we have Paul's transformation. So this fellow Saul, who was part of the execution and the martyrdom of Stephen, is now chosen by Jesus to be the one to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. This hardened, legalistic Pharisee who has imprisoned and killed Christians, persecuted Christians is chosen by Jesus to be the one to take the gospel to the Gentiles, the people he formerly hated. Um, Saul the persecutor encounters Jesus, and Saul's name is not changed to Paul, um, like Abram is to Abraham or uh, Jacob is to Israel. Paul is the Greek form of his name, Saul. So I want to read uh, chapter 9, verse 15 and 16. But the Lord, this is Jesus, said to him, Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. I will show him, meaning Paul, how much he must suffer for my name. So this is a, uh, this is a, a guy named Ananias who is instructed to disciple Paul. And uh, he's and God is telling him, Jesus is telling him, this is my chosen instrument for the Gentiles. So powerful. Ananias is told by Paul about this. Paul, look at this. Paul is to endure hardships. He's promised hardships. So Paul was brought to Damascus. He was discipled by Ananias in Damascus. After learning he was going to be killed by the Jewish leaders, he escapes and goes to Jerusalem. And he's discipled by the other disciples, by the apostles in Jerusalem. In chapter 10, the scene shifts back to Peter. And Peter has an encounter in chapter 10 with the Gentiles. So Peter's at a tanner's house when he received a vision from God, basically explaining to him the gospel is to be for the Gentiles as well. That which is which God made clean, we shouldn't call unclean. So a tanner's house where Peter's at 
is actually a very unclean place. Um, Peter delivers the gospel after this vision to a man named Cornelius, who is obviously Cornelius, a very Greek Roman name. And before he even finishes the sermon, the Holy Spirit falls on them. They begin to speak in tongues and they receive Jesus. It's the first time that a Jew is 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 bringing intentionally to Greek pagan people the gospel from this a church is formed in Antioch Paul moves to Antioch and this is the first multi-ethnic church of both Jews and Gentiles getting together as like believers um, this church in Antioch is where he, Paul meets this fellow named Barnabas, and they are they they are uh, commissioned to go on a missionary journey that takes them all the way through Galatia. Now I'm going to show you a map here of Paul's journey. So Galatia is southern Turkey, and there's a number of cities there which Paul is going to visit and have ministry in. He's going to have great success. He's going to have lots of persecution as well. But then he comes back to Jerusalem and the, she, and the scene shifts back to Jerusalem. And here is where we have one of the most important chapters in the book of Acts outside of chapter 2, and that's chapter 15. See, there's a controversy. Because there are some Christian, Jewish Christians, Messianic Christians, who believe that in order for the Gentiles to become Christians, followers of Jesus, they must also become Jewish and follow all the strict rules of the Jewish law. Keep kosher. Keep the Sabbath. Celebrate the holidays. All of that. And, um, and circumcision. That's going to... Uh, kind of dull the amount of male converts you get once you start saying you have to be a circumcised in order to be a Christian. All of these are, are coming together and this big controversy comes. Um, both Peter and Paul testify. Uh, Peter talks about his, his visions in his time with Cornelius and Paul testifies about his missionary work and how the Holy Spirit has fallen and, has, and he's developed these churches throughout Galatia. And the council in Jerusalem uh, decides that Gentiles do not need to become Jews. And they write a letter. And I'm going to read for you that letter because it's so important. And we're going to start at verse 23. And this is what they wrote. From the apostles and the elders, your brothers, to the brothers and sisters, the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. That's... Galatia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some of some without our authorization went out from us and troubled you with their words and unsettled your hearts, we have unanimously, underline that, unanimously decided to select men and send them to you along with our dearly beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas who will personally report the same things by word of mouth. For it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours, so they were in line and in league with the Holy Spirit, not to place further burdens on you beyond these requirements, that you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. You will do well if you keep yourselves from these things. Farewell. So, this letter is really important. It is the blessing of the church in Jerusalem for the rest of the world. For the rest of the world. And there we have the beginnings of Paul's second missionary journey. Now, Paul and Barnabas get into a spat because Barnabas wants to bring Mark. And Mark bailed on them on the first missionary journey. And... Here we have one of the church's earliest divisions between two of its greatest saints. Paul chooses Silas and he goes on his way. 
Barnabas chooses Mark and he goes on his way. We don't hear from Barnabas again. But Paul and Barnabas, after their disagreement, they must have made up because as we talked about in the book of Mark, made up with Mark. Um, Luke and Timothy also become part of this story. And through Galatia and up into Greece. So he go, Paul goes even further this time. Three more prominent churches are founded, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Corinth. All of these churches are super important to the rest. Paul's third missionary journey in Acts 19 through 21 is basically to revisit all of the prior churches found uh, and also the founding of the church at Ephesus. The church now has the presence in the two greatest cities of the ancient world outside of Rome, Corinth and Ephesus. And when we come to the end of the book of Acts, it ends with Paul being arrested in Jerusalem, sent to Caesarea Maritima on the coastline for a number of years, and eventually being shipped up to Rome. And uh, when he gets to Rome, that's where the book ends. And that's where we're going to end today. So if you like what you're hearing, what you're listening to, um, please like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, share a thought or two in the comment section. And uh, until next week, God bless.